Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood." So what we're going to do today is we're going to wrap up this series. We've been talking about Imago Dei. This is just a fancy phrase to say the image of God and that we were created in the image of God for the purpose of reflecting Him. And one of the ways that we reflect Him is in our lifestyle. And another way that we reflect Him is in the, the works or the gifts that we use, that the things that we do on the earth. And so what I want to do today is once we kind of walk through this text a little bit and maybe refresh ourselves, remind ourselves of some of the things that we started in week one, I want to end by essentially just kind of showing you my whiteboard art that just kind of brings us to a place of conclusion. Now, I apologize ahead of time for my artboard work. Um, it's always a mess. It always looks like a mess. People walk in at the end of my prep time and they look at my board and they look at me and they always just kind of shake their head and they walk off because they have no idea what's actually going on on that whiteboard. So the creative team had it for about an hour to fix it up a little bit so it could, they could give it to you. And all it's gonna do is basically just summarize some of the things that we're saying today. At least that's the intent of it. But I'm not gonna show it to you till the end because if I show it to you now, you're not gonna listen to a word I say. You'll just sit there looking at, you know, and it won't make any sense, and then we'll have a really hard time for the next 45 minutes, but I'd rather it not be like that, so we're going to show it at the end, right? All right, let's jump in here. What does it say? It says, looking to Jesus. If we're going to run the race that is set before us, in other words, if I'm going to live the life that God determined for me to live before I was even born, if I'm going to do that, I have to look to him because I'm not going to find the answer in myself. Rather, I'm going to find the answer in looking at him. And when I look at him and I reflect that which he shows me, then I will fulfill the purpose for which he has called me. When I'm always looking to him, everything starts with him. Grace starts with him. We have sometimes told a story of grace that essentially just says that we don't have to do the things that God's telling us to do because of grace. That's not at all what grace means, even kinda. It's just that it came first, that God moved first. And because he moved first, I'm always looking to him. And when I look to him, he shows me what it is that I'm supposed to do. And so my faith is simply a response to the grace. My works or what I do is simply in response to what God has shown me. I am called to action reflect God. I have to run with endurance the race that is set before me. And what I will never be able to do is run a race with endurance that's not set before me. What I hope has been sort of emerging out of some of these conversations is that we don't get to choose our gift. God chose our gift. God planted that gift within us, and then he calls us to walk in that gift. If I'm running or trying to run, pursuing a race that he didn't set before me, I'm never going to be able to do it with endurance. The only way that I run well and I finish well is if I run the race that he set before me. And the only way that I can run the race that he set before me is if I'm looking to him. Because here's the thing, if I look to the world, the world will have all sorts of demonstrations of different gifts and of different pathways. And if I'm being excited or moved by the world, then I'll jump on the world's pathway and I'll race toward the world. But if I'm looking toward Jesus, then I'm jumping on the pathway that he's laid out for me and I can run that one with endurance. But I have to look at him. And sometimes when we talk about reflecting the image of God or that we were created in the image of God, we can have a tendency to look at ourselves and say, okay, well, let me figure me out and then I'll project that onto God because if he's like me, then if I can know me, I can know him. It's the opposite. I have to know him so that I can know myself. I have to look to him because he is the author and he is the perfecter. So we started out this conversation looking to him, so I just want to keep us in that same pathway. 
looking to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Let's start at the beginning, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created. God created. That word that the ancients used there was the word Elohim. Elohim is a plural word, but yet it is spoken in the singular. Why is that? Because they had to understand that God had many facets, God had many characteristics, and God would demonstrate, he would show himself in doing these characteristics, and then they would begin to um, name God as this or that or the other, and over time, they would forget that God is all of these things, they would neglect this stuff that God is, and they would just want to pick the one thing that they saw him to be that they needed most, and they just pull that out, and now this is what they worship. I'm not sure that was supposed to happen. It was pretty cool, though. Um, but we, they'll just look at this aspect of God. So Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim, in the beginning, God created. But they would talk about El Shaddai, the God who is almighty, or El Elyon, the God who's most high, or El El Olom. What, is, what does that say? That says God is everlasting. So he was, and he is, and he is to come. What he was, he will be. What he is, he will always be. And so they began to see him, and they had faith in him to do the thing in the moment that he had done in the past. And so they recognized God to be able to move now because they saw what God had done. Or they would be in the middle of war, and they needed his mighty hand to be upon them. And they would look to El Shaddai, the one who was almighty. They needed him moving in their lives. But God is all of those things. He's not just one thing. God is just, yes. God is merciful, yes. God is gracious, yes. God is good, yes. God is judge, yes. God is love, yes. God is all of these. And so we see in the beginning, God. And then it moves on and it says that the spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. So we see God, Elohim, and we see the Spirit of God. So now we see two persons who are called God. And then if we go further, there's this moment where God introduces himself by a whole new name. And he describes himself as, if you're an ESV reader, Yahweh. If you're a King James reader, Jehovah. And so he expressed that he was what he was. I am that I am, he said, which is uttered by the phrase in English, Lord, that he is Lord. So he is God, he is the Spirit of God, he is Lord. And so they began to understand him as being these three persons, yet one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 brings it very, very tight in the conversation by saying, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So in seeing that God, who is one, has three persons, and then I am supposed to love all of him with all of me, I then recognize that there are facets to who I am. And now I need to understand me a little bit better as I understand him. In 1 John chapter 5, 7, it's the most clear. It says, there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, 19, we are given this model for baptism. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There is this picture that we see in the baptism of Jesus. I just want to remind you that it was not the Father who became flesh. It was not the Holy Spirit who became flesh, but rather the Son of God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word of God who became flesh was given the name above every name 
the name of Jesus. And when Jesus was in the river Jordan and John the Baptist was about to baptize him, the heavens opened up and we hear the voice of the Father. Why was it important for us to hear the voice of the Father? Because there would be false doctrines who would later say that as Jesus being the Word, He simply was the voice of the Father. He was not separate. In other words, He was not His own identity, but rather He was just stored up in the Father and then the Father created Him. I want you to know that the Father did not create the Son, but rather the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were co-existent. They are co-eternal. They are forever in the past. They are forever in the future. There was never a time when the Father existed without the Son or that the Son existed without the Holy Spirit, for they all exist together. And that's, that's huge. Because there are persuasions today that are confusing Christians by saying that Jesus was created and then he became God and then they say to us, and so you were created and you're going to become God. No, 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 no. No, we're never going to sit on the throne. I want you, we are, you, if that's what you're thinking, if you're thinking the end is you are sitting on the throne, we have a misconception So we understand God to be co-existent, co-eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and these three are one. We see this baptism moment where the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Where was the Son of God? Was he in the heavens? No, he was on the earth. God became flesh. That matters. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. For us to be forgiven, God had to become flesh so that he could bleed and die for our sins. So the Father from heaven spoke, this is my beloved Son. But then we see the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove. Is the Holy Spirit a dove? No. Did he take the form of a dove? Yes. How could he do that? Because he is spirit. John 4 tells us that God is spirit. The reason why that's important is because now as I go to look at myself, I have to understand that if I was created in the image of God, and God is spirit, and God can take different forms, guess what? His body isn't like mine. So it's not my body that was created in the image of God. And there's an importance to that as I push even further and understand how creation happened. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us. There's that word us again. There's that plurality again. There's that speaking to the three persons again. We cannot deny the doctrine of the Trinity from Genesis to Revelation. It's consistent. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Who were them? Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion. We see it in Genesis 2. We see it summarized maybe the clearest in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. When God created man in the likeness of God, male and female, he made them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. So what I have to understand is God said, let us make humans. And he made man and then he took man and made woman. And so now there is male and female who are both made in the image of God. This is an important aspect to embrace because both male and female are blessed, both male and female have dominion, both male and female were created in the image of God. Now, what, what that forces me to do then is to look deeper on the inside of me to understand what part of me is in the image of God. Because if I look at my wife and she's made in the image of God, then I wasn't. If she looks at me and says, he was made in the image of God, that means she wasn't. I'm not, we're not talking about the body of male and female. We are talking about what is inside of the body. So now I have to go deeper into the conversation. 
which we already saw in Deuteronomy because he said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That means there's a whole facet of you, there's an all of you that you need to be able to love all of him. What that means is that part of your body needs to love him. Your body isn't exempt from salvation. Um, let, let's do this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. Every part of you is called to be kept blameless. If I could just take a side journey, I want to maybe clear some things up that I said week two, or if you weren't here, just say some things. Um, there, there is the growing conversation in our society about peace and health and our mindedness. When we are talking about mental anything, we're, we're talking about the soul. It's where your thoughts are, where your personality is. We're not talking about a body problem or a spirit problem. We're talking about the soul, your, your mindedness. And so the conversation is that we are, uh, because of all the pressures and all of this and all of that, that we are not healthy and we have things maybe that need to be worked on or whatever. And, and let me, can I just speak to that for a minute? But before I do that, let me just express that there are absolutely people on the planet who absolutely have an unhealthy mental state. Absolutely. Mental health is an issue, yes. And for someone who in their, their physiology needs help should absolutely get help. Whether that's a pill or whether that's a conversation, people need help, just like the body needs help. There are times somebody might have high blood pressure, somebody might have diabetes or whatever, and so they have a pill that helps them. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everybody in the bell curve that we are wanting to look at and say, oh, they have this, or they have that, or they have that. Most people don't have whatever it is that we're saying they have. They don't. Like we saw this in universities about 10 years ago, there was all this conversation about safe spaces and making spots for kids to be able to just be in and not be challenged and not because they were getting too anxious or whatever. Um, now, 10 years later, we realize, okay, that didn't work that well. Now the big conversation is resilience. Why are we having to talk about resilience? Because we spent a decade telling kids that didn't have anything wrong with them that something was wrong with them. But let me just say this. Here's what is a problem. Our lifestyle is on a railroad to hell and we're upset or we're worried about it and we're carrying this anxiety and this worry because of the condition of our soul and we are not going to fix that with therapy or a pill. When your soul is on its way to hell, there is a troubling, there is a conviction within you because the Spirit of God will literally convict the world of sin. Like that is His role on the earth. And so if you are on your way to somewhere that God doesn't want you to go, there is going to be the presence of conviction in your life. That conviction is not anxiety. That conviction is not worry. That is God saying, turn around, repent before you die and show up in a place that you weren't created to live in. I thank God that he's speaking to people and telling them, get this right. Let me just say anecdotally, because most of you aren't preachers, I can pick on preachers. Preachers have more uh, like, like issues in their head than they've ever had. And you want to know why? Because they all live like the devil. I'm tell I sit down with preachers, they curse. I could sit down with preachers, but when I was a kid, they'd come sit down at my table, sit down with my dad. I never heard cursing from preachers. Never. Never, no preacher that preached 20 years ago ever sat down with my dad at a dinner table and cursed, ever. I never heard it. I never saw them drink. I never saw them do, it. I like, and trust me, I was nosy. <laughs> I'm just telling you like 12 year old Sean, time to go to bed. Now the preachers would sit around the table and tell stories. I came out of my room, I'd be just hiding at the, just ducking, listening. 
I sit down with preachers today. They drink everything they want to. Their language is terrible. And then they wonder why they're wandering down the road with worry and anxiety because they live like the devil and they have to stand in the pulpit. Of course they're worried. But, but here's the thing. It's true for all of us. So the God of peace, what is the next conversation? Sanctify you. What is that? That is a making your lifestyle holy. It is setting you apart for his use. And that is a process. Like I hear people say all the time, oh, don't worry, Sean, don't worry. You, it's, his grace is enough. Like you can't lose your salvation. Could I just submit to you that every single person ever, ever, ever has lost their salvation at least once? Everyone. Here's what we know. We were created in the image of God. So when your mom and your dad came together, God is the father of your spirit. Your mom and dad might have been your mother and father, but he, the one who ever lives, who was and is and is to come, he fathered your spirit. He breathed life into that moment of conception and made you, you. God decided you. You, you might have inherited things from them, but God decided who you would be. And so in this moment, you were perfect and you were born alive unto him, full of him. This is why we believe that whether a mom loses a child in uh, the womb or whether a child dies early, that that child wakes up in the presence of God. This is evangelical Christianity. Everyone believes this. Nothing about what I said anyone disagrees with. Everyone agrees that we are born alive unto God. Well, if I'm born alive unto God, and then there comes a moment where all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, what does that mean? That means I was born alive, and then at some point, I died. What does that mean to die? It means I lost what I had. Because my body didn't die, but my spirit died. Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul said, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. That means I lost my salvation. That is every single person. Everyone lost it. And those who by faith said yes to Jesus receive it what? Again, you're, you're saved because you had faith. You believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. When you said that, your body all of a sudden spoke something in agreement with heaven and then the Spirit of God then came and filled you. You are now filled with the Spirit of God. We see this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. It says how God chose, remember Jesus is the author and the finisher, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you have Christ in you, there is a hope that you have for the glory of God. In other words, there's a hope that you have that when Jesus comes, your body will put on immortality and you will live forever with him. That is the glory. That is the blessed hope. That is what we are waiting for. If you don't actually have that glory in you, there will be a discontentment in your soul with a longing to get back to that place that you were born with. Your spirit knows what it is like to be filled with the spirit because every single person who was born is born in the presence of God and had him. But because of sin, we resisted him. There's a point in age of accountability. I don't know how old that is. It used to be 13, then it was 14. It's probably 35 now. I've, I mean, you just look around. I mean, it's getting older. I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere. 
There is a point of accountability. And when I reached that point of accountability, sin came alive because I chose it and I died. What, what does that mean? I lost something. And now the soul lost the Spirit of God next to it and it will spend its time in a place of frustration no matter how talented, no matter how wealthy, no matter how good everything looks, the soul will be disturbed in the absence of the Spirit filling his spirit. And so I'll long to get back to that. And in the absence, now there's a, there's a frustration. And so there's a calling now for those of us who said yes to Jesus. The Spirit of God returns, fills our spirit. Now there is the necessity of the soul to be renewed in agreement with the Spirit of God next door, which means I have to reset this body of mine. Because the body wants to do what the body has always wanted to do. The body actually wants to go to hell. I'm convinced of it. I'm, I have full assurance that the body is perfectly content going to hell. But you have to reset the body by renewing the mind. Like, I, I don't know how, how you were, but prior to, well, I, I don't know, even, even some having said yes to Jesus, I mean, there's some working some stuff out. Like, I don't know how your body feels, but when somebody pulls out in front of you, <laughs> so I'll go 17, 18, maybe 19, I don't know, maybe 20. Uh, they're in front of me. There's part of my body, one of these parts. You pick the one you want, but one of them, it used to just go up in the air to let the person in front of me know that I'm not happy about that. See, the body has to be reset because it just likes to do stuff. How do I have the strength to reset the body? Because as I renew my mind, I take an aspect of the Spirit of God within me and I awaken Him within the mind that gives me the strength, the power to say no to sin. And so as I come into the knowledge of him, I have the grace, the strength, the power to say no. Is it necessary? Of course it's necessary. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Why is it important to see the Lord? It's important to see the Lord now and it's important to see the Lord later. Why is it important to see the Lord now? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, now we all with unveiled face. How do we have an unveiled face? It's because I was filled with the Spirit of God. When I was filled with the Spirit of God, the veil that kept me from seeing him was parted. Now we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, wait a minute. I thought I was filled with Jesus. I, I thought that Jesus is Lord. Wasn't that my confession? How does this come from the Lord if the Lord is the Spirit? That we takes us back to the Trinity. This is why I keep harping on this over and over and over. Jesus, when they saw him, they said, show us the Father. What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Was Jesus the Father? No. But he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I'm filled with the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of the Father, and who is the Spirit of the Son. So now this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So I'm by the Spirit, literally placed in Christ. I'm placed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. But it's important that by the Spirit, I'm placed in Christ because otherwise there's no way to the Father. For Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one leads to the Father. No one will get to the Father except through me. So when I say Jesus is Lord, the Spirit of God fills me, which connects me to the Son. And by the Son, I am connected to the Father. There is a special particular order in getting back to the Father, which takes me back to the Garden of Eden when I just had fellowship with God. So as I reflect Him, I have fellowship with Him. That means I look more like Him. I'm being transformed into the same image. 
I see him. Without holiness, no one will see him. So there is a holiness, there is a lifestyle that is required at each level of glory. And I just want to say there are steps. And I don't know how many steps there are. There could be a hundred, there could be a thousand, there could be five. I have no idea. What I do know is wherever you are with God, there is a requirement of you in your life. This is why it says, cast aside every weight so that you can run with endurance the race that is set before you. And then if you want to start and complain about it, the gospel turned around and said, don't complain because none of you have suffered against sin in the way that Jesus did to the point of shedding your own blood. So shut your mouth and just do what you're supposed to do. Like, he didn't say that, but that's exactly what he said. So what we do in modern preaching, somebody says, oh, I'm just struggling. And the modern preacher says, oh, you're fine. The old school preacher said, um, you haven't suffered to the point of shedding your own blood. So lay aside every weight. Look at all the cloud of witnesses. We all did it. You can do it. Let's keep moving. That's old school preaching. That's preaching that led people to heaven. That's people that led, preaching that led people into the presence of God. That's preaching that helped people be transformed. I don't think anybody comes to church to be the same miserable person they were three weeks ago. I think we step into church because we want to have the fullness of God within us to transform us to be the person that we weren't. Because if I was happy being the person that I was, I don't need to be this person. All right, I'm going to calm down. Here's why this matters. Because he talks about using your gift according to the measure that you have. The measure that you have is according to the measure of the reflection of God that you demonstrate. So the amount of the anointing upon your giftedness will be connected to the amount of the reflection of God that you demonstrate. So when you live like him and you look like him, there is a greater anointing upon your life when you use your giftedness, and that means you will be more effective. I am thankful that I'm more effective today than I was two years ago. But you know what else is exciting to me? Is that if I just keep on my journey of following him, I'll be more effective in 10 years than I am right now. Why? Because he's gonna keep leading me from glory to glory, from glory to glory. We are being transformed into the same image. And so now let's talk about this. Sorry, you can throw that graphic up here. So now we come to this place where we are reflecting the image of God, and in reflection of the image of God, now we have to come into understanding or awareness of these gifts. God has gifted every single one of us at, at, in the womb with a spiritual gift to fulfill. Every single one of us. So if we're gonna talk about last week you had homework, I know everybody did their homework. Everybody went home, you read the red, you saw where God was moving by a particular way through the life of Jesus and demonstration of a measure of the Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus had the fullness of the Spirit of God. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse two said, the Spirit of God, the full measure of the Spirit of God will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so we see Jesus moving in every facet of the Spirit of God that was upon his life. When we get to Matthew chapter four, we see this moment where Jesus was tempted by the devil, where he was literally in the wilderness fasting and praying and Satan came to him and said, hey, you're hungry. Go ahead and tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Satan said, okay, well, let me take you to the highest point of the temple. And he said, go ahead and jump down because you're the one who said in the Psalms that if you even dash your foot, that an angel will pick you up and carry you. And he said, oh yeah, Satan, uh, you, it also says that you will not tempt or test the Lord your God. Well, that wasn't enough for Satan. So he gave his final temptation. He said, hey, Jesus, you're the son of God. You're supposed to be the one that gets all the kings and the kingdoms and be king of kings and Lord of lords. Just go ahead and bow down to me and I'll give you everything right now. Jesus said, no, 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 no. No, you will only worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. What happened in that moment? Jesus was, Jesus was demonstrating the fear of the Lord. More than what he wanted, more than what he was there to do was he was there to obey his father. More than anything, he was there to commit to the will of the father. What is that? That is the fear of the Lord. When you have the fear of the Lord, you obey him. We've tried to clean up that word fear so much to make it so cute and clean and nice. At the end of the day, the fear of the Lord means you know that he's the boss and if you obey him, you'll live with him forever. If you rebel against him, you're gonna die and burn in hell. That's the fear of the Lord. You wanna know what the fear of the Lord is? That's it. When you walk around with the fear of the Lord, you will obey God. 
And here's the thing, when you spend a lifestyle of obeying God and you start reaping all these rewards, then you realize, oh, wait a minute, all of a sudden this fear actually matures. Now I actually want to obey God. Now I actually want to do the right thing because the right thing leads to awesome rewards. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4 says that the soul of the sluggard craves and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. I'm inherently lazy. I'm busy. I like to be in motion. But if things get hard, I just like to skip it and move on to the next thing. I just move on. Like, I don't know how you took tests, but when I, I would just, if there were 10 questions, if I knew nine of them, I didn't care about the one I didn't know. I wouldn't sit there and stress out over to 90. I was happy. Like, it didn't, it didn't matter. If I, if, I, if I start to do something at home and it's like I'm sweeping and the blower's broken and this, it doesn't work, I'll go put the broom up, plug the blower in and wait 20 minutes. Why? Because it's hard. But there's a diligence that is required of us. And so I have had to learn to do the hard things because what I noticed was my giftedness would hit a wall. And the wall is I was gifted and I could get to here on my own, but I needed to actually spend more time with him to go to the next level. I needed to study a little harder to go to the next level, but I didn't want to do that, so it was hard. So I would just be happy with whatever this was doing. No, no, there's a diligence about us. Jesus, he said, look, you, you've got to fear God more than man. You've got to fear God more than yourself. He demonstrates this. Then in, in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, he teaches, he sits down on a chair and he teaches us. What is that? That is a spirit of counsel where from that giftedness, Jesus taught the saints. And then we see him perform miracles in chapter eight and chapter nine of Matthew, demonstrating a spirit of might. He was demonstrating the power of God. And then in chapter 10, we see him choose his leaders. We see him choose those who he sends out to do his work. What was that? That is a gift of leadership flowing through a spirit of wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, you aren't gifted to lead. There is a giftedness that is required for leadership that comes from a spirit of wisdom. We see that in the New Testament, the first time that they sent church people, called them forth to lead things, they had to be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. And so then we would see this in, in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Jesus would demonstrate a spirit of knowledge. That is a prophetic word. He spoke over cities. He said, look, you have not repented. I've done amazing things. If I did amazing things in these cities over here that I destroyed, they would have repented long ago. But because I did them for you and you didn't do them, you're gonna end the same way that they ended. What is that? That's a harsh word. We always talk about, oh, Jesus is so loving. Yeah, woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Cherazin. There's loving. Okay, that was harsh. <laughs> but he was operating in the, a spirit of knowledge in that moment. And then chapter 13, we see this spirit of understanding flow where he takes, Proverbs tells us, and all that you get, get what? Get understanding. He told them a parable. They had no idea what it meant. And then he sat down with them and he spoke to them the meaning of the parable. What is that? That is Jesus giving them understanding. So in all of these, he operated in this way. Now, I don't know the giftedness that you have. I don't know from what bowl of the, the flame of the Spirit of God that is within you to operate in the certain giftedness that you have, but I know you have something. I know you have a giftedness to use. And I, I wanna put an emphasis on the list that is found in, in Romans chapter 12, because that is the list that we are told to use these gifts. In, in spirit-filled churches, we tend to, we like to really emphasize 1 Corinthians 12. We like to talk about utterance of wisdom and knowledge and prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and healing and miracles and discerning of spirits. We love to talk about all that stuff. But do you realize that those are at the will of the Spirit? He never told us to use those gifts. He said, desire them. Why did he say desire those gifts? Because they're his. And at his will, he operates in that particular way. But in the Romans 12 list, when we talk about prophecy and exhortation and teaching and leadership and, and helps and exhortation, I think we said that one already, acts of mercy, serving this list, he says, you use it. Why? Because that's what's in you. You all by yourself 
can use a gift of service if you have it. You all by yourself can demonstrate acts of mercy. You all by yourself can sit down and teach. There is, if you, if you have knowledge of something, you have the capacity to gain knowledge. I never want the teachers to think that you're a gifted communicator. We've missed that. That's not, there are a lot of people who communicate well and they know nothing. They can't help you because they can't help themselves, but they're great talkers. Our generation is full of people who are great talkers and they're empty. A teacher is full and a teacher who is full can take what is in them and teach you and fill you. They may not be a great communicator. The apostle Paul said he wasn't a great communicator. But if what is in you is by revelation, then you have something to teach others, right? So there are gifts that we all have that we need to share, that we need to demonstrate. But you can do these. But you can have somebody in front of you sick as a dog. And if the Spirit of God doesn't will literally through you to heal them in that moment, you can't heal them. God never told you that you had to heal somebody. He heals. He delivers. He restores. He sets free. He works miracles. So I just desire these manifestations, but I use this gift here that I have every chance I have to do it. And I make that point because I don't want you sitting at home waiting on an opportunity to heal somebody when you might have an act of a gift of mercy and just walk across the street and find somebody suffering that you can help. Because that's a gift that you have. You'll be moved with compassion. Let me just say this. People who have a gift of mercy, when you see suffering in the world, you actually want to go do something and help it. But let me just say this. You're also told to do it with cheerfulness. How do I do an act of mercy with cheerfulness? That means I have to be a good steward of my gift. So it's not just going and clothing somebody and saying, hey, you look great. And they say, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And walking away. No, no, there is a cheerfulness. How can you move in a gift to a place of cheerfulness? Because you take them by giving something, by doing an act of mercy, you capture their attention. You now buy equity with them. You let leverage that to say, oh, let me introduce you to Jesus. And you take them from a place of suffering and you bring them into the family of God and you connect them now with somebody who has a gift to exhort or a gift to prophesy in the moment or a gift to teach and they can take and mentor them. But you don't want to sit around watching people get mentored. You want to go back out to the suffering and find people who need your mercy and keep giving it to them. Why? Because that's your gift. You, some of you with an act of mercy, you're stuck in discipleship circles and you're miserable and you're wondering why. And you're like, I just feel like I need to do something. Yes, you need to get out there and be merciful to people and allow them to see God through you so you can bring them, drop them off to the person called to disciple and you go right back out to where you were. All of us have a gift and you can run with endurance the race that is set before you when you're using the giftedness that God placed within you. And here's something else that I would like to propose that it seems like is true. When we do what we are gifted to do, we capture the attention of God to manifest and do what we cannot do. Jesus needed to borrow a boat and Peter, by a gift of generosity, gave Jesus his boat. And he said, you do whatever you need to do with my boat. But how did it end for Peter? Jesus said, oh, get back in your boat. Go back out there. Throw the net on the other side. And what did Peter do? He caught more fish than he could even fit in his boat. When Peter did what he could do, God answered and did the thing that Peter could not do. There were two ladies that had a gift of service. Their name was Mary and Martha. And whenever Jesus was in their town, they would give him a place to stay. They would feed him. They would serve him. They would meet all of his needs. Like Jesus would come in and they would just, what do you need, Jesus? What do you want? What do you want to eat? Where do you want to sit? And they would sit there and honor him and serve him time and time and time again. And what happened was when their brother died and now they needed a miracle, what was it that enabled them? them to tap into the miracle power working of Jesus because they had served him time and time and time again. And the ones who served him said, Jesus, our brother has died. And all of a sudden, Jesus, who had the power of God working in him, went to that house where he had been served time and time again. And he went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, 
come forth. What was it that woke up the power of God that a man would be raised from the dead? It was two sisters that served him with everything that they had. With everything that they had. So there becomes the responsibility in us to use our giftedness for the purpose of advancing the kingdom. And when you do what you are gifted and called to do, I promise you, the manifestations of the Spirit of God will flow in our midst. And as they flow in our midst, the dead will be raised, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear because the saints served and they led and they gave and they prophesied and they taught and they were merciful. They did everything that they were called to do. And all of a sudden, when they did on the earth what they were called to do, heaven and all of its glory came down. When we reflect God, God shows up. 